mandatory questions. And then section B, where you can pick any two out of, it should be three questions, yeah. Then section A carries 50 marks, and um, each question in section B carries 25 marks, which means um, section B in total carries 50 marks, and the total for examination is 100 marks. And obviously, um, you have to start each question on a new page. So with regards to section A, it will most likely be um, a case study uh, question. As I said the last time, it's more of an out to prax scenario where in the past you'd actually have to try and hack into a system, but in this case you don't have to. You just have to know the processes involved and how you can apply um, those different processes to different um, scenarios and case studies per se. So for the first one, it said um, you have been contracted to perform a pen test by a highly respected law firm called DAB and Associates. The first part was explain the stages of the pen testing process, taking care to note the tools you would use and why you would use them at each particular stage. So th this particular question required you to understand what the, the pen testing process you actually understand that say exactly. Because it is about, um, I think it's about five or six stages involved. So you had to outline each of those stages in Zirimo. And then also for each stage, you would state what tools you would use. Like let's say if it's for the stage A kind of reconnaissance or information gathering, I'm sure the group which is presenting on pen testing will cover this uh, very well. But then basically when it comes to pen testing, the first stage actually in on the information gathering kind of reconnaissance. So it's basically where you collect as much information as you can about the organization that you want to hack into or the person that you want to hack. So in this question, what, it, what would basically be required is to state Kuti, within the context of Kuti, um, the company that you're doing the pen test for is DABM Associates. You would state then Kuti, um, with respect to NIA information gathering, what tools would you use? Um, one example, in Panimino, it was the harvester. Uh, I guess that means one of the groups will have to present this um, presentation. So there is a tool. I'm sorry, just hold on one second. Okay, um, sorry for that. So there is a tool in on the harvester which you can use for information gathering. Just to be clear, I'm not going through the answers for every single question in the examination. I'm just sort of like trying to show you how would you be expected to answer each question. So going back to the question here. So in this case, Zunzi, you have been hired to do a pen test for a law firm, you know, the DAB and Associates. So the first stage, do you know, the reconnaissance and And so what you're expected to respond in this question is, for each stage, you remove pen testing. Um, you know, the key stage, and you should explain it, good machine last And then also, you have to then make note of the tool you would use, of which in this case, at the very first stage, information gathering, the tool you would use is um, the harvester. Then also you have to state quickly why you would use that tool at that particular stage. And so the harvester, you know, so quickly, oh, collect my emails, addresses, Agasiana, Siana, Ivan, Shandra, the target company that you want to try and hack into. So that's all basically a part of um, the stage uh, information gathering. Another tool that does the exact same thing or something similar is why on the hunter.io. What it does is it allows you to just simply enter like an organization's name. Because the point of this whole activity is to try and find a gateway into an organization. So in this case, the gateway is maybe a person, Anushandra company. But then 
the easiest way you can find which works for this particular company is either through using the harvest at Tuyoyo or going to the site on thehunter.io. Then you type in um, the name of the organization you actually. So what then pops up is a kind of 64 years outside. These are like all the different um, email addresses that are available on the internet. Even like I and I say, and I will work for this particular organization. So what then you will do is after doing this, yeah, the next stage, manji, answer do a question part one year. Even after you've gotten kind of the email address here, and since I could this organization here, you can then try and friend them on Facebook and build a relationship now with the goal of ultimately using those, exploiting those relationships to any access to their systems um, one way or the other, either by maybe even dating them in some cases with the ultimate goal of gaining access to their organization. So that would have been how you would answer one component of the question of part 1e. So um, the one thing that I'm just trying to emphasize here is most of the questions that you see in the examination has my what is Nema, can you briefly describe or outline or list? No. Most of them are either application questions. They would see you're applying the knowledge you have, or my questions, they would see you have to synthesize the knowledge you have now and so in some cases you have to combine Jamaica did the Zemaita attack, the ethical hacking, the digital forensics, and then ultimately give an answer which factors all those different um, elementary pieces of knowledge that you have as one response. So um, that was for question A, part one. Any questions so far, Pane, the structure, the question, or how you would be expected to respond to it? Hello? Python, I'm still audible, aren't it? Yes, we can hear you. All right, that's fine. Um, so I'll move on to the next question, yeah, sure. So the next question was, um, the partners at the same law firm have contracted a third party as their managed security service provider. Which is basically some company, yeah, which basically involves them having an external party manage the security operations for them. So you'll find with the, um, this concept, MSSP, may not have been covered within the course outline or explained more class. So for things that may seem um, incredibly foreign, kind of examination, you basically get kind of a brief description of is written And there's um, then the MSSP has requested that you map one particular attack campaign you have performed on the MITRE attack framework. So these terms, an attack campaign, what is the MITRE attack framework? The group that is presenting on this would obviously um, explain what they both mean because you can't understand the attack if you don't know what a campaign is. And um, by definition, a campaign is just a number of that and with the goal of compromising your organization. So they can steal your passwords, they can do the social engineering, they can send you my phishing emails, so you can enter your own personal information without knowing what you're doing, so they can social engineer you. All like a composite of my activities at CNSCM is what basically um, creates what's known as an attack campaign. But I'm sure the group of the might attack will explain this a bit more with better examples. So using the attached matrix in figure one is guidance. Explain in detail one attack campaign you can perform along with the corresponding tool you would use to perform each stage of the attack. The campaign should only involve the following techniques. Um, initial access, execution, potential access, discovery, collection, exfiltration, and impact. So it was the fig one actual is this particular diagram, which is here. Mm -hmm. 
Alright, um, so basically whenever we speak of this animal, you know, the Zimaita attack, we're basically referring to Jidagra Egypt, which outlines the different ways and techniques someone can try and hack into your organization. Um, you won't necessarily have to understand each and every term, Irimum, but just basically knowing what um, each of these things means will help you greatly as you deal with the security. But if I was to explain each of the headings in brief, um, initial access just means how did a hacker get into your system? As in, did they send you an email, a phishing, or did they use some sort of um, flash disk so they could access your computer and use my valid accounts in your organization? And then execution is um, how they manage to run software in your, comp in your computer after they gain initial access. Privilege escalation means could see how have they managed to or maybe, does anyone know what privilege escalation is? Hello? Has anyone ever heard of escalation? Yeah, so basically there's a concept known as privilege escalation. If you log in as a guest user, you find some way to make yourself kind of administrator with a um, computer at your um, Defense evasion. Any guesses on this one also? Yes, Ishmael. Maybe from from the wedding itself, after probably the process of elevating yourself in terms of user rights, probably to be an administrator, now you will have the ability to even bypass antiviruses or even to disable them or even disabling any password protection because you already have administrator rights. So I think it's a way of bypassing any other protocols that are set up. Yeah, that's very correct. Um, thanks, Ishmael. Let me just make a note of that. Okay. So, um, as Ishmael rightly, rightly highlighted, um, the concept here, defense evasion, is just basically trying to run away from my antivirus arimo or any controls which can stop you from doing whatever you want in a person's system. Um, one thing I typically say every time, but not to say anything to do with computers, is the English language came before um, computers were invented. So basically, whatever term you come across in Ingeri, Mufuji, Computing, you just basically take the English definition you and then you put it in the context of computers. So just as they said, could be defense evasion. You're obviously trying to um, evade some sort of, some sort of defense, whether or teaser, some sort of defensive mechanism in the computers. And the most common defense of mechanism in systems can be computers, my antivirus, my firewall, and so forth. So basically, that's what defense evasion means. Um, then also there's credential access. Anyone would like to hazard a guess on this one? Put you with credential access, what are you referring to? Hello, Sam. Yes, Nanana. 
I think credential access, it means now having access to the important information, things like the passwords, the licenses or security keys that uh, that will be used by a particular person. Exactly. Um, so again, credential access just means that you've gained access to my different um, user credentials are you on that system, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, Then the next one is discovery. So discovery seems quite generic, right, if you just look at it as a term. And then these to my sections or these to my boxes to the below section of discovery. Basically, um, I should stop saying basically so much. Um, they generally outline, could see, how can a person perform this thing called discovery in different ways? Could it can be either browser bookmark discovery, password policy discovery, but if peripheral device discovery, permission groups discovery. So taking into context um, the different ways Zipas and Saba, can anyone try and guess what, what does discovery really refer to um, in this context? I should zoom in a bit so it's a lot more visible. Any guesses? Um, I guess so. so with discovery, you just yes. Um, you can go ahead. Um, it, it's not a guess, but I'm reading from the internet. Okay. It then says, uh, um, I don't know if it's the same, but it's saying network discovery is the process of identifying or mapping internal networks. In this process, a particular computer can com communicate to another computer on the same network using a protocol. In a given organization, a network is set up in a way, in such a way that computers can communicate and share files internally. So maybe the the hacker will now be discovering the different networks and the different communication paths within that um, organization. Yeah, um, that's very correct. Thanks, Nyamazo. So just to add on to what she has correctly highlighted, it doesn't just end by Nikuti, uh, my different networks are equal. You can also then discover my different um, devices are dependent to battery power. Or you can discover kind of my bookmarks are in browser, any other applications they have running per machine in Papo, um, any other accounts that are also installed on the same computer, and any other processes on the exact same computer. So that's basically um, all this information as a process of um, discovery. Then the next stage is collection, collection, which includes aspects such as um, collecting archived, collected data, capturing audios, um, getting data from a system Yemunu, or just downloading clipboard Yemunu. Um, by clipboard, we're referring to every time you want to control C, there is a location in your computer where that file or that text you want to control C is stored. And that location in on the clipboard, which is basically stored in your RAM. So if somebody, if you somehow tend to copy my passwords ARCO before you log into anything, it's always stored by clipboard for a certain period of time. So if somebody basically downloads your clipboard data, they can actually get everything you've um, copied and pasted, which includes your passwords if you've done so before. Um, then also, as I said, uh, data from that system, collecting data from my shared drives at Planet Work, or collecting data from my removable media, or even collecting my emails, Ivan, that all falls under the domain year collection. At this stage, say, Eka, you're now beginning to gather what you feel could is important data or is important information. Um, so after you've collected that information, you then have to find some way of how do you take it off 
the computer yacha yawai hacker. Like let's say you had hacked into someone's phone. But stage a collection, you would have um I, I guess if you take the example here to a your Pegasus, your router Amazon, it allows you to do kind of audio captures a little and maybe even like record videos using the cameras you perform patch. So with collection, you would basically um, perform my recordings, you would collect my SMSs, my WhatsApp chats, um, if there are any emails or pictures uh, or documents stored before you purple, all that activity of collecting them during this collection. But then after you've collected them, you then have to remove them from that phone, which is the server, which is the computer, which so that activity, you can move us, you know, from one particular location, which is the target computer, which is uh, on your own personal computer, doing on the exfiltration. I think for those who've um, heard, watched kind of movies, it's just basically you are taking something um, of value from one particular location to another location. So in this case, particular exfiltration, it can include um, compressing the data because obviously, can I my audio recordings, can I my emails, and more, can I my pictures, they'll be like really huge files. So in order for you to make the process um, shorter, you could translate data level. You just simply have to compress it and then send it here a compressed file. Um, other ways you can do so is um, over other network media or doing so over a physical medium, saying you're going to flash disk if it's a computer. Or it can even be just virtually information to the cloud, um, to an account, Yaumna M cloud. So that's what um, exfiltration is. Then impact refers to um, what would have actually happened at the end of everything. What is the ultimate goal here? say my acres in this particular scenario. So it could be destroying data revano, where you basically format my hard drives abo, where you can encrypt the data abo, as was the case with my ransomware attacks, it called Darai. Um it can be to shut down the systems or to reboot them, or even basically deface be it a website kinda um any resources a organization actually. So in brief that's basically what the MITRE attack matrix is. It's a diagram that helps you map Kuti Kanatai Equa. How can you categorize each and every activity at IT? Because only after you've um, categorized those attacks, Aitka Kwamui, it's then easier for you to know what's in the Anakati attack. But I, I won't. Um, then go so far as to explain in depth how do you know it using this particular um, tool. I'm sure the group ritual that is going to present on this can also cover that as well. So yeah, basically that's how you're supposed to answer part two. And then for part B, I said, the question was, yes, hello. Yes, I just wanted to ask, is the MITRE attack framework the same as the cyber kill chain or is two different things, but that can be mapped uh, directly together? Okay, um, that's a very good and also a very technical question. So I'll try and not go too um, deep with the explanation. The cyber kill chain, Iacho, right? So basically there's this company, you know, the Lockheed Martin, it's very big when it comes to yeah, the cyber security. So what they did is they came up with this unique approach. If typically when companies try to hack you or when my, my hackers or my state actors when you when they try to hack you, what process do they typically follow? So that process EOEM and different activities that they do dealing with the cyber kill chain. So in response to the question, yeah, Vunzwana Tawanda, which is um, very relevant also. What we were explaining, Pamsura app, this is basically actually known as the cyber kill chain. So the cyber kill chain involves my stages, like I see and I say, and I the first stage, the initial access, 
to execution, privilege escalation, all the way up to impact. So what you Soroku, Deutsche owns the cyber kill chain. But what this company owns in Maita went on and did is they then went on to actually um, further explain Kuti. When we're saying with initial access, what do we mean? Then they broke it down into the different ways people can actually gain um, initial access into your system. So we can basically say Kuti, uh, the cyber kill chain is what then led to the creation of the attack matrix or to the attack framework. Um, I hope that answers your question, Tawanda. Yes, sir. Very clear. Wow. Great. Thanks. Okay. Um, so then the next question. Let me just take down this. Tawanda. All right. So then the next um, question was, assuming you are an incident response commander at a regional data center that offers data storage and analytics services to many clients, and you have been notified that um, two of 15 workstations in the marketing department subnet have been infected by a particular ransomware. So again, or a case study, make sure see the way you give your response or the way you answered, you answer the question actually takes into consideration or is mapped onto the case study actually because their marks are awarded for that. Of course, you can just basically um, explain my concepts without then referring to the case study, but you won't get full marks for um, that particular question here. So in this case, you're supposed to clearly explain how you would use a combination of the incident response methodology, which is this one. Um, computer forensics from my videos, my slides, and I got to meet um, I gave a very detailed explanation on what this thing is. And the same also even as the cognitive task model. Um, the cognitive task model is a, a sequence of steps that you follow every single time you want to perform a forensic investigation. Kuti, what do you do right from the first stage, Yaonobata computer emunu, which collect the evidence? and then up to the final stage where you go into a court of law and you explain with the Chicha in that particular case you So the thing that explains that whole investigative process, do you know the cognitive title, which I also went to um, quite some length, did you explain in those videos, Nema audios and I had to meet Arpa Google Classroom. Then the incident response methodology, one thing you have to understand is the incident response methodology. Let me just go to the slides if I can. Okay, um, just to clarify. So with regarding, well, regarding this particular question, this is the video, Yacho, and I think these are the audios and actually for my explanations to these particular slides, which I'm opening now. So, incident response methodology. Yeah, um, this is the cognitive test module actually, and it's, ex and it's explained quite in depth in the audios, Nema videos, Aripop. And this is a visualization of what exactly happens um, in that process actually. But then this whole process E, doing on the forensic investigation. And whereas the incident response methodology, is outlined in this diagram you're having. So what the incident response methodology that does is it explains um, the whole process of how you can respond to an incident, right from preparation, I would see when you create my policies, when you install my firewalls, um, when you set up my teams, in organization, you put in the event that something happens, what do you do? When you set up my business continuity plan, my disaster recovery plan, that all falls under pre-incident preparation. But then 
the process here cognitive task model, which is the forensic investigation part of it, only comes in within these two boxes, the rapids, Saganzi data collection and data analysis. So only in this stage, ye investigate the incident, can we apply the cognitive task model. So when you see a question, Inoe clearly explain how you would use a combination of the incident response methodology and the cognitive task model to forensics are respectively for this particular incident. What that means is you would first start by explaining the incident response methodology, which is like the bigger picture. And then can also a stage year investigate the incident within the incident response methodology. You then move on and explain this process E, which is basically the whole investigation process here forensics. I, I hope that's making sense. Could it, this process E is, or this chi diagram EG, based in to this diagram per section E? Could be, um, how would you use a combination of incident response methodology in a cognitive task model? We're basically asking you to embed the section when you explain this whole diagram. That's where the point in the area, you'd find some question end up being a fusion of them. Because of course you can explain this diagram really regularly. Um, and the last one was basically what he has noted that um, cross-site scripting may have been used at some point of the attack to help you a vulnerability. Then you have to distinguish um, cross-site scripting from cross-site request forgery um, attacks. So within the course from the to our presentations, by by someone would have explained the of the cross-site scripting and XSS. And then another group would have explained the of the CSRF cross site request for Jerry. But this week, I'm not someone explaining good advice yet. You know how to define what XSS is, and you know how to define CSS of distinguishing. Do not be the footing in your application. They would see your knowledge of good teaching on XSS, knowledge of good teaching on CSRF, and then differentiating them from each other. Um, section A and this uh, for section B you have to answer two questions out of three. So there'll be three questions and answer any two of them. Operation. It's a common typical examination question. So it will come in a different format, but in most cases, it will definitely come as a question. So it's always very key for you to understand what, you, um, what are the elements of malicious operation. The same applies to the CTM earlier, the incident response methodology. Those ones, they will most likely always come, but the way that they come, they will see on a CM. Can you complete the actual canality? It comes in all these different ways, but it never comes in a question able to explain the C, the cognitive task model, can't explain the incident response methodology. It's always a synthesis and a application. So when you are reading or preparing for the examination, avoid approach saying you're memorizing my concepts, because ultimately, my personal goal in Debuti, you can actually use this knowledge within Mammon industry, man. Be it um, as a data analyst when you're trying to understand the process, investigators, or you're trying to help them 
um, gather and better understand what they may call evidence for any what she it my activities how. So um, for question three, Pakatanga Papi were like a general business model. Ye a company which um, typically steals information from people and then tries to sell it elsewhere. So now you are supposed to break them down as the six elements of a malicious operation, which I believe Arimu's slide should be in this slide. Runs the threats and adversarial behavior. If you check here, yeah, this one runs the slides for threats and adversarial behavior. Um, there are actually three videos which go to quite a length explaining this particular set of slides because they're also very key. And as I said, Nyayema elements of malicious operation is what we would definitely call a typical examination question. It will most likely, if not always, come as a question. And so Pachopanizma elements of a malicious operation, um, we basically have six of them, which are explained here. So what this means, or what this topic basically covers is in the past, when people performed king and malicious online activities, virus and stuff, it was not for financial gain. It was typically because they wanted to find a challenge or something challenger, or they wanted to and do things for fun. It wasn't actually a business model. You would see you can hack into people's system, into people's systems and computers and make money from it. So now when we have gotten to the world of today, you could see my organizations like Asiana, Asiana, which were my criminal syndicates. They're basically moving their operations from the streets and bringing them online. So when we speak of this topic, even my elements of my malicious operations, Arkunz, my malicious operations, Doma, Cartel, Amunona, Achita, like these uh, malicious activities, it can be maybe offering a service. If you pay us some money, we can perform a denial of service attack on any company that you want us to attack. Or it can be if you um, pay us some money, we can then perform a ransomware attack on a particular organization that you may want to um, compromise. So basically, these are my hackers for hire, but not as individuals, but actually as my fully functional organizations. So they would have six main elements or six main um, ways that they operate. Could they have my affiliate programs, which is basically some fancy way of marketing themselves through my clients. Are. They would have my infection vectors, which are the different ways they can compromise my system Zivano or send malicious messages either via email or Arima virus, Kanama web, and so forth. And they would obviously have infrastructure, which is my servers Avo, um, network equipment Yavo. And obviously, on top of these, on top of this infrastructure, you would need Kana and the secret source company, which is a specific type of software which can be used to perform marginal service attacks, or it can be some specific software which can be used to perform my ransomware attacks. Then in addition to that, you can't run away from it. You need people. So you'd always need um, human services because it's an organization, malicious. So you'd need kind of an HRI in that particular organization. You would need um, some people to manage your call center you put in the events, any of your clients or ma aku hire, you put more some organization. If they have any challenges, they can always get in touch with customer services. Um, and then in some cases, you would find with funny some sites and they kept a regime. But when you try and log in, please click this panipani robots. Can I find this pane can I boat or pane bascore or something like that? Many computers are not able to complete that. So that's where the human services also come in. So you can be then paid to 
just simply always make sure that you fill in my capture sites on behalf of these hacking organizations. Then for my payment methods, like making my payments through kind of cryptocurrency or through my remittance services. My remittance services, um, I think is the most popular way of making payments for malicious activities behind my cryptocurrencies. Because in many cases, all they just need is an ID before Atomira, and they're like really difficult um, to trace and link a particular hacking incident. Which brings me, I think, to a question, Yangayaka Vunzwa, I think it was the day before yesterday. You would see in the event that a company has decided to get somewhere or to pay the RAM. How would they do it practically? Um, what they would basically do, um, is sites the tax form. Actually, what Paxful does is it typically flourishes when you can see cryptocurrency, kind of Bitcoin, Yagambano. So what Paxful does is it links you to at another person at a more within the area that you are in or at a more within the same country that you are in. And what you do is you're only going to cash a bit, eco cash, money uh, transfer, kind of PayPal, and you want to buy a certain amount of Bitcoin. So you basically pick Kuti, how do you want to make the payment here if it's via eco cash and the amount here to your Kuda? Um, let's say in US dollars, you want to spend kind of 100, which is equivalent to approximately 0 0.00513 BTC. So now we're saying, Kuti, let's say the company that hacked you said, Kuti, 200 Bitcoin or 200 USD, Ethereum. Um, you can also create an account. Um, the more ways I would want to buy uh, uh, Bitcoin, then you click on find offers. What then happens is you'll find um list, we're actually looking to either buy or um, sell our cryptocurrency. So saying we you pay the patron one, and when you see to my thumbs up to one or another, so this means this person has quite a good reputation, and many people have worked with him before, and he has good. We can actually send to him and um, complete the transaction, and also put what are the limits? which is written in this um, particular case. Uh, is one of my peer to peer actions I involve a um, directory because Kubang Chinos and Wenigan Jinguti, you transferred money from one account to another account, but they don't know what power transfer Maria account in Mumun, the goal was for you to actually get Bitcoin. They would um, actually realize that you purchased Bitcoin or not. So um, I'm not sure what you the question, Yashu, but I hope you've been answered. It was pure. Yes. Um, is she in? Spirit, are you answered? I guess she is maybe shocked by the response. Could you always want you to get the time? Um, so yeah, that's basically um, how that process would work, and that's also how you would respond to a question. You would see um, my elements in my malicious operations. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, yeah. Um, go ahead. This is. Yeah. It's okay. Um, maybe from your experience, I would uh, like to find out the probability of finding a hacker compared to not finding a, the hacker. Like I, I heard you mentioning that you know who hacked 
the system. So I'm curious to know the odd. Okay. Yeah, um, one of the things that if any of you do decide to um, focus on working with forensics specifically, because in those few that you know, Tragonzi, who did what and how did they do it, um, I would strongly advise advise against promising what you will find the hacker is, because it's a well known thing. What the Mufio the cybersecurity, this concept in on the attack attribution. The attack attribution, which is basically saying with the, who did this, is incredibly difficult. And this is the person who hacked our systems. It's highly unlikely, unless you have um, be it my video recordings and the person actually lifts their finger and sponge and everything. But since it's digital and it's the internet, I'm sure kind of want to explain a kind of presentation and IP spoofing and DNS spoofing. You'll find that it's very easy to manipulate someone's computer, could eat something on your behalf as a hacker. You would see when you look at the logs, they would in or what IP address, which then implies what computer attacked our systems. It can point to one person who actually has no idea what teacher it. The reason being somebody else was using their computer without their knowledge. So um, what would be most key in many cases is primarily recovering from the incident actually and making sure with whatever damage has been done, um, you find out as in what loophole or what vulnerability system has been manipulated, could have been in system A, and then remediating by making sure you get back your systems back online. The whole aspect is load checkout in the Anagar data. Of course, you can try and do that, but I promise you, it will take um, a lot of your time. And maybe it shouldn't be like one of your major priorities as opposed to first putting your systems back online and making sure that you patch any loopholes and end up into an now. Okay. That's Thanks. Uh, thanks for asking the question also. Um, all right, so moving on. So that's basically how one way a question Yema elements of a malicious operation can be structured. And then the next one was um, assuming you're a network security analyst at AliExpress, um, your CISO has asked you to, repair, to help him prepare a presentation to the board of directors on how a sin flooding DDoS attack works. So this is also one of the presentations, it's a child one, the Madido Sandit. So how it was performed, which ended up shutting down the company servers and rendering all the shopping services inaccessible. So bearing in mind that the presentation's target audience is the company's board of directors, which is, um, I guess, senior level, senior management and at board level, explain the following in detail with the aid of simple illustrations. So, with respect to against part AE, um, and the steps involved in setting up and performing a DDoS attack, you could, as a student, I could answer this question. You could give a very technical response to this question, which tells about DDoS and which is like all these fancy big words, Jama IP, submitting, and all that, but you will not get all the five marks you only get the full five marks if you take into consideration whether your target audience is the board of directors. So you cannot try and use my terms, you lose your audience. So what this question is basically requiring of you is not only could you, do you understand the technical concepts but then are you able to explain them to an audience which is not technical? So, if you go to the extent equity, the diagrams that you use in your explanations has the type you would see in a textbook. But which you would use to just simply explain 
how does a DDoS attack work? Again, this goes back to the way in authority, the way the questions are structured in these examinations. But it's not um, a case where you just have to basically regurgitate information in RP and return it as it is, but you have to understand it and then know how to actually apply it. Because the way I would explain to um, a team, yeah, it technical, kind of IT engineers, kind of systems engineers, could teach you on the same flooding, can teach you the TCP three-way handshake, should be completely different from the way I approach this explanation to my IT managers. It should also be very different to the way I would approach explaining this concept to kind of an room banking sector or to people that are going to law firm, even to see the way that you um, respond or the way that you explain a particular concept should always um, take into consideration what's the audience the article explain acquired. So I can guarantee you in the examination, you'll find if not one or two questions where the target audience is specified. And when the target audience is specified, there's a certain part which is given or which is awarded in the way you structured the explanation. That's why one of the key words that was used was my simple illustrations. We wouldn't expect you to then um, draw an actual network diagram in my IP addresses, like Awanda and all that, using my submit, mass casual, and all that. We wouldn't expect that because the target audience for this particular question is a board of directors. Okay, so again, um, obviously, yeah, and the, the impact the and company operations and how you can basically protect the organization from um, Madidos, Madidos attacks um, in future. So that was question four. And then lastly was question five, which was um, in terms of cyber threat intelligence. Uh, where you're given a case study, and then you're ex allowed to explain kind of stages actually in the threat intelligence life cycle, my challenges that you would face. And um, lastly, and with the aid of roll up illustration, explain the concept of DNS spoofing and highlight what you would use as IOCs if you wish to share threat information regarding DNS related attacks. So there's another example here my synthesis questions, you could see you're taking the knowledge you have of DNS spoofing and the knowledge you have of my IOCs, which are known as my indicators of compromise, which fit into this domain you say about intelligence and how you can link that information and actually draw a diagram, get it well labeled. You just link out the notion that says and how do they relate. So yeah, basically that was, um, the structure of the uh, examination lecture from last year. Questions regarding the structure examination or the structure of the questions. Uh, hello, engineer. Yes, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm not to a well detailed uh, a response sheet to, to those questions. Maybe that might also help us. Um, is a well detailed response sheet another way of saying to the solutions manual for the examination? Yes. Yeah, the likelihood of getting that one is very low, but I can give you kind of. Um, my point is, how best can you answer some of the questions? Ah, that will be perfect. Thank you, engineer. Oh, that's right. Um, any other questions? I guess there are none. What, what I will give you as an assignment, though obviously you won't be submitting it, um, over the weekend, if you get a chance, please go to my videos at April that um, I shared in the classroom for different topics um, and the material if you can. Of course, you won't go as in-depth 
Chi Viringa material actually is but if I find anything chili interesting or chili confusing within the material uh please feel free to bring it through Muswe Monday when we have uh the next class here so we can basically discuss it as a class or I can demystify whatever may seem quite confusing. Um I it's a benefit in a way with Pani weekend pack at Penasi Nimuswe Monday. So you have a bit of time to just basically go through some of the content. And if you have any questions that need clarity, um, you can also ask them. I'll upload this uh, examination last year for those who may want reference in some of the, uh, um, So there's just one main topic I wanted to talk about today. Then I can let you get back to your weekend. Um, which is the issue here, characterization in adversities. Within this particular topic, I wanted to highlight specifically um, whenever we're dealing with my different crime, Akuma and my cyber offenses, they are split into two categories. Anons my cyber enabled. Nema cyber dependent crimes. And just also to highlight, considering that I have gone to such lengths that the team will cover this topic in specific, I guess it goes without saying within do my typical examination questions, actually. So we basically have Anunzi Ma cyber enabled crimes, Nema cyber dependent crimes. So with respect to let me see if there's any place where they were simply explained. No. All right. So with cyber enabled Shuguti, there is that have been always there. And that even before technology existed. Single crimes, same stalking, um, theft and so forth. And then uh, my crimes equity, they only came up after technology came around. The honors my cyber dependent crimes. All right, while we're still what a cyber enabled on technology. And in many cases they can be performed in the absence of technology. computer, you can still possibly um, perform a attack. Then my cyber crimes, they could kind of personal technology. You can never have these crimes existing. You can never have these crimes happening. Um, can you give me any examples of I think I my cyber crimes? for my computer, cyber dependent. You know, cyber basically basically means this is the internet. It's dependent. It means that that particular crime depends on the internet and for its beings. Enable that computers and the internet enable people to perform these um, crimes. So any guesses on what my cyber did? Can, can I try? Hello? Yes, um, you can go ahead, Leslie. All right. Um, what about internet banking, like um, theft? OK. So that's what in English is in the enabled. Cyber crime, cyber dependent crimes. Enabled. Okay. Can I also try? Go ahead. Um, Elizabeth. Yes, how about the cleaning of bank cards? Uh, can it fall under cyber dependent? 
the cloning of bank cards um, is for under cyber cyber dependent. You said. Yes, I said cyber dependent. Yes, um, that's the question. Tingati card cloning in Okwana area and uh, cyber dependent. Bearing in mind, Kuti, cyber dependent means we cannot perform that crime, but na technology. Yes, I would say yes, it falls under cyber dependent because it needs technology for one to clone the card, maybe through scanning that card, or I don't know. And is it, um, sorry, do you understand? Is that it? Hello? Um, do you understand? Hello? Yeah, okay, Father, you can go ahead. There is that um, element where people, uh, the theft of cryptocurrencies. Hmm where people they collect uh, cryptos from people and then they just disappear in um in the air so that's, uh, which, that's uh, um, cyber enabled cyber dependent i mean okay <laughs> i was about <laughs> possible to actually trade my cryptocurrencies but it's also true and it that would also be classified under cyber dependent um in other things, or thoughts on my different. Um, Cliff says my leaders, they are cyber dependent because we cannot perform. Uh, and obviously, into the internet and computers. Um, so yeah, those are a few examples of I think I think my, my cyber dependent crimes. So the first. Um, if you are taking notes, I would say, could you please take note of this particular topic, Yaganzi, um, close five incentives to moving uh, criminal operations online. So what this basically refers to is, could you, um, you'll find could you, many businesses that were already operating in the physical. Uh, let's take a drug dealing, for example. Um, it's always been there. So this guy was a claw, he did the research, Agati, what are typically the five main uh, reasons why a cyber-enabled crime, such as drug dealing, um, may be moved uh, online? And it, so as we go through this particular example, um, maybe we can also highlight my example that we feel may fit in. I'll just basically use the one year drug dealing as a, a simple example. So from the knowledge that we have of the Jema movies and Jema books, how drug deals basically work is you go kind of a street corner somewhere, you meet someone, you pay the money, they give you the money, uh, ah, they give you the drugs and then you take the drugs and then you go. So one of the first uh, main incentive, you can tell one, was that using the internet, it is easier uh, to find and to victims. So in this case, if I was a dealer and I decided to create kind of a website where I sell my product online, BGT, all you just do is you make a payment using some sort of cryptocurrency or whatever, and then I mail the drugs to you or I tell you to go and collect them or something like that. That's one example of um, how using the internet it is easy to find and to contact victims. Anyone with a different crime in mind, it may fit this particular bill. Using the internet, it is now easier to find and contact victims. Yes, you can try. Um, yes, let's take a go ahead. Human trafficking. Human trafficking. Um, yes, they how... can pose. Okay, That's they can pose as a, as a recruitment agency, or they can pose as if they link you to jobs outside the country. And then uh, once you apply or once you get, uh, they, they then take everything 
that uh, of course some of them can even may not even take your life can just take your funds or your money that you have actually just um, saved along here yeah. yeah very true and very correct um, so I guess human trafficking is another very good example of Atingati my cyber enabled crimes because in the past you probably have to go to Nevan or who are in your area and convince them Kutiva it is a human trafficking, but now it's just easy. You go on the internet, you create some fake company, and people try and apply to the company, and then you exploit them, like um, she, she, she has mentioned. Uh, Charles, let me just check what Charles said. Yeah, um, Charles said um, tourist organizations have also gone digital in terms of recruitment. Um, can someone explain a bit more, Kuti, how does this actually apply? The terrorist organizations have gone digital in terms of recruitment. Can I to explain that a bit more on um, Charles? Charles, is your audio working? Are you able to explain a bit more? Hmm. I think maybe Charles's audio isn't working right now. But um, and explain that. Uh, okay, engineer. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, in terms of rec recruitment, you look at the terrorist organizations. I remember there was a documentary that I watched on Discovery Channel where these guys would would penetrate or infiltrate the youth, especially in America, uh, targeting them so that they will, you know, necessitate. Uh, my, my activities are or even help them into gaining access to other platforms or even deploying my my, my bomber our power language so they will just use uh, you know the internet to befriend and then eventually recruit and brainwash especially the young uh, children in schools or colleges so on that documentary, I remember they were just saying, Kuti, um, they were actually trying to push for, for the idea that people who are under the age of 18 must not use the, inter, the internet without supervision of a, an adult. So I think that is one of the, the issues to do with the recruitment when it comes to terrorist organizations. Yeah, um, th thanks for raising that. Can you also add on that, uh, engineer? Yes, um, sorry, this is courage. Okay, go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, in the Jajang Zashona, because in those thousands, we go to Wangalajo. There's this particular organization, you know, target uh, my youths uh, on Facebook. They look for those ones, and I'm going to my radical posts, whatever, I know Zita, my revolutionaries, or whatever. And Vovava, like Tao was saying, Vovava, it's more like Vova Gruma, Mukova, radical, and eventually Voto Supes, Zeravato Panduka, and Vato Vano, I'm not even So, yeah, that's another way as well. Okay. Hello. Yes, but I um, think go ahead. Um, the other thing with terrorists, they, they need people with special skills. But it is very difficult to transport maybe those people to certain areas, maybe where they'll be based. So what they normally do, especially in this era of uh, technology, they, if you have maybe data analytics uh, skill, which they need, they will mm -hmm. just recruit you wherever you are, depending on your credentials. And then they start uh, teaching you their their business up until you are you are in and then maybe you can just do the work for them and then it goes maybe when you are paid up then the relationship goes or maybe you keep on going with them thank you okay so they can also hire you as a contractor you mean interesting um okay so robert has mentioned money money laundering and cliff also highlighted identity fraud and then Saul mentioned um arms dealing Okay, so um, that basically explains how, um, for the first main incentive 
Yes, um, is there a contribution? Uh, okay, I just wanted to to say something. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, right now there's an artifact Irukuneza. Is it in Italy or? Yeah, it is in Italy, where it was it was sold a more underground network in reality, the black internet or the, whatever they call it. Wow. In in terms of um, integrity in this underground network or my, my, my underground dealings and anger, are there some form of laws? Because, for example, this artifact is said to have been bought by a collector. A collector, my artifact, uh, you know, of this historic uh, nature. How does they... Mm-hmm. How are they controlling this whole network in terms of making sure that if you want to participate into this uh, network, your products have to be uh, up to standards or they have to be genuine, original? Does this mean that there is some form of, you know, interfacing between these parties that are, you know, in this underground network? That is my my you know, my thinking, if they are meeting, it, it is possible that we can actually find who these guys are in some instances. I don't know. I just wanted to have that kind of clarity. Yeah. Um, so so what you're referring to you know, is the dark web, which is um, basically a, a section of the internet. I would say, well, you can't really access using an account the normal way, you would have to access them using a different type of technology, even the Tor or the Onion router. What Tor does is it um, hides your IP address in such a way that would see no one can actually determine who are you. And then you access my sites at your earning actions my dot onion websites. You could see you can't access them obviously using Anacrow, Nana Fire, uh, the normal way. You'd have to first install some software, which is like a gateway into that particular dark web, actually. And then you go to my sites, your anagrams, and so forth, and you search for whatever you want on that particular domain. Yeah, so, so like it's similar to Jana Craigslist, Jana Craigslist. In terms of the integrity of um, the artifacts, actual or whatever things you want to buy. The way these criminals typically work is, it's actually a business card, meaning what they would maybe want to actually sell even more artifacts in future. So if the channels are not communicated now, which are also um, hidden in a way, and if on those channels, then your reputation goes down and then you can't actually perform any more transactions going forward. So you'd find that your reputation actually helps you to get um, access to the larger market and to actually continue operating on the dark web. The same rules are more in normal society. Those notions of the ikoko. Because the system is very, very then people will know which no varavaravan, and then they won't actually deal with you. Of which the ultimate goal is not for you to just make one deal over when a papa repair. You want to continuously continue to um, make money off that particular field, be it putting some drugs, putting some guns, or like even performing the most repulsive crimes on the internet. You'll still want to continue. It's not just a once-off thing. So I think as psychology, I don't know if I'm answering your question correctly. Uh, yes, you are actually answering correctly. Was I just sorry? I thought these guys would never meet, but it seems it is more of a trust uh, that is happening between the the participants. Uh, hello, sir. If you can just comment as well on that one. Um, Michael, is there a question? Uh, I want I wanted to to add a comment on 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 uh, on Taurai's question. Yes, um, go ahead. Yeah, just like uh, if you saw on uh, on Paxful, a, a person will be having my 
like those my, 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 my thumbs up or even let's talk of say can uh, okay my verified um uh, my verified applications like uber more like my endorsements so basically even also more like my endorsements which you know this person has been doing uh business uh, continuously and successfully Sorry, engineer. Can I please ask a question on that one? Yes, sure, Craig. Go ahead. Seeing as Jagnet is full of uh, techno wise people or, or hackers, is it safe for me to access the Jagnet using this simple computer of mine? Of course, using an Atowatch or Mata, whatever. But can I, is it safe for me to, to try and access the Jagnet using this simple computer of mine? Um, the simple answer is no. It's not that. It's not that safe. Um, all right, machine I need to tell you is it's basically a version of Firefox. You see, you have Firefox installed and a program which allows you interface using Firefox. So it's a version here, Firefox. Firefox. Um, a flash player and console already pre installed and vulnerability in a game browser. Let's get access to your computer. access is completely so and also what accounts you use I used to be a has a dot .org domain Pajnozi, a site in a dot onion domain. I'll just post it for comment. So, any site in a dot onion, like if we take on a facebook.com, that one you can access particular internet, particular internet here. Do but then, can happen to Facebook dot uh, onion? You can't access it on the regular internet, you can only access it through Tor, as in through that particular network here. So um, I know the thing manager with Tor, I may be expanding a bit too far here, but the reason why it was created initially was not to commit crimes um, online. The primary reason why it was created was, like in some countries, um, they would see Ghana, Venezuela, or North Korea, they would see the dog like restricts access to the internet access to communication channels, they would use they can't be tracked. So initially back at Godzilla, I mean by when I Jacob Ebelbaum and so forth, then I got to give access to people who are in countries that they would be one of the one like the government is against them, basically. So we want to give them access in a way that they're not tracked by the government. But the sad thing now about cybersecurity is basically every technology, it can always be used for something malicious. Like we saw by the um, you know, genuinely when it was created, the goal was for your own personal protection you would find someone with a hacker mentality. You would ask the IGT, I'm going to use this tool to encrypt all your files to make sure that you don't get access to any of them. So, yeah, I may have a guanangu out of the Scorpio explanation, but I just felt good to you to understand that not only was tool created for a good reason, but as all other tools, the remote cyber security, they are all made for a good purpose, but somehow they end up being used for malicious reasons.
which is very unfortunate. Huh? But I, I hope to in my long speech and later uh, somewhere I've answered your question, Courage. Yes, you did, Engineer. Thank you so much. Oh, that's fine. Sir, can I ask, is it possible to determine why people actually do this, like, why they hack? Is it because of poverty or it's, it's, it's a game? Um, like, why do they really do this? Yeah, um, I guess that's like a whole other topic here. I recently came across... Spotify also. Um, it's breaking. Okay, I hope I'm clear now. Okay, so, um, for those podcasts, I would recommend diaries is there on um google podcasts kind of i am not sure but he and i usually listen to it the guy will just basically basically it's the guy who frequently uploads um my episodes in one way or the other and the intentions of the person watch there was one scenario which he basically outlined. So, our question is you find that many people who are in tech, specifically many people who are in cybersecurity, they have a lot of time on their hands. At times, in your equity, your services are only required when something happens or if something needs to happen per company patch. So you'd find that those people have a tendency to have moonlighting, which means kind of they do some other job and some other hobbies they engage in. Like, as accurate, in general, you'll find that you have security. So you'll find that for some of them, it's so they can get paid. Not good that they need the money, but others, they want to charge. They want the experience. They want to broken and I have benefited from it. What they're interested in is not the money. It's just the feeling equity. I have this sort of power. I can control a whole organization. Just from So the motivation is actually um, But if you'd like to hear a lot more stories and very current and the motivation behind to my different ways people can be at their sim swap sim swapping really oh crap sorry
Hello? Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, engineer. Yes, engineer. Yes, engineer. Yes, engineer. Fine, fine. Thanks. Um, it's very good today. Sorry? I was saying your network is very bad today. So some of the things we are getting, you are, you are, you are breaking. Okay, very sorry about that. But I hope now, yeah, Nani, is it better now? Yeah, that's better now. Okay. Much better. Yeah, so I was just, um, I think I was explaining, could see the motivations, I don't see, I don't see, I don't. but for most of them, if it's not financial, then it's most likely in here, could see they just want to challenge um, you could break into some system that they've never done before. Or alternatively, in getting here, you could see they wanted to feel the power. You could have actually got this company's system in the palm of my hand from just my own computer. Like, I mean, nobody really benefits from encrypting my files in kind of a hospital and stopping people from getting medication. But at the end of the day, or ultimately just feeling the power I have a whole organization or a whole health system under my control. But then I also mentioned, Kuti, if you can visit, um, I think I typed it in with Darkness Diaries. It's a podcast where they just basically um, talk about my cases like Asiana, Asiana, in different ways people have been hacked. Um, the last um, episode, Yatriator and is this guy who had his phone SIM swapped. There's a see somebody takes over your line without you knowing. And at the end of the day, that person started harassing Munui Wanga Bira Lai So, yeah, that was just one example about the extremes someone can actually go to just so they can. Um, try and get access to your systems. And the motivation in that case was quite silly. IT, he, he didn't even want money from the whole situation. He just wanted to feel good to see I am powerful, basically. So yeah, the motivation is Anosiana Siana, but in most cases it's either as a hobby or in some cases it will be for financial reasons. Hello? Okay, um, I, I hope that was a, that, that was quite clear in the explanation. Um, so continuing, I'll just share my screen again. Um, let me continue from where we left off. So the first one was Kuti, using the internet, it is easier to find and to contact, vit and to contact victims. The second one was um, by using the internet, criminal operations can be run more cheaply. Um, maybe just one or two guesses, they would see what criminal operations can be run more cheaply by using the internet. Any thoughts from anyone? Any thoughts of, on a crime or a criminal operation in um, It becomes cheaper if you do it using the internet. I, I guess, well, if I had given an example, I would say in the case of drug dealing, um, in that scenario, you would maybe have to board a bus or get some sort of transportation, wanting a fuel or whatever. Could we know the Sangha and the Moon or do things about drugs? But then now, since um, it's now over the internet, actually um, having compared to the physical community faster. How does the internet help crimes to be performed faster? Any thoughts on this one? Uh, I think uh, 
what, what comes in my mind is the 419 Nigerian style, uh, where we, we always receive emails where they purport to 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 be looking for help or to or we want something. Uh, I think it was difficult uh, before the the internet because they used to use uh, letters. Now they are using emails, so it's faster because mm-hmm. they use and they, they they can reach people many people than they they used to. Oh yeah, so, yeah, yeah that's actually good. Um, that's actually a good example. Yeah. Yeah, please. Hello, so that was admire a little. Okay. Um, Clay, Clayton, you want to add something? Yes, I wanted to say, perhaps another way in which um, the internet better facilitates crime is uh, the profiling of the target profiling. For instance, a mercenary or a, a, a hired killer can actually profile their target effectively by using social media. And to that effect, they can then uh, do their job more swiftly because they will have more information. Yeah, this, this one is actually a really good example. Um, but then I mentioned identity theft. Uh, Spiro asked, what about DDoS? Um, any thoughts on DDoS? Will it... fit into this category. But compared to the physical counterparts, the internet allows crimes to be performed faster. Cliff? Hi, Cliff. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I would say yes, for, for DD, DD um, cyber-dependent crime, uh, which can only be com- committed using the computer. It's uh, different from uh, from these uh, cyber-enabled crime, which can be done without the use of the internet. Yeah, exactly. Um, with DDoS, it also fits under cyber dependence. Because it's cyber dependent. Um, then the fourth uh, incentive is that using the internet it is easier to operate uh, across international boundaries, reaching victims located in other countries. Um, any examples of crimes which may fit this bill? Could be using victims located in other countries. Um, I'm just people are putting things in the comment section. Any guesses or thoughts on this one? So I think it's quite straightforward, right? Um, in that, even if it's um, Selling some merchandise or, or drugs or anything like that, it's easier to send. I wouldn't know if it's easier though to send drugs to a different country. But yeah, basically, it's easier to operate across international boundaries with some crimes. Single year, human trafficking, Yambutoro area, year. You have to actually get people to come to your country and then money. I'll say something. No. Okay. Pickle for criminals to get. Get caught by to get caught. I think this um, goes back to yeah, um, as Charles said, cross border crimes like human and drug trafficking. Um, so on the last one, I was saying, I think this goes back to the point I'm going to raise earlier. 
the attack attribution. Because it's very difficult for you to actually say which Indian Munaga are performing this particular crime. And in addition to that, Pamsurapajo, I guess we can say. If somebody, somebody in Kana Japan, and then they are brought to Zimbabwe by some mule or something like that, it's difficult for the Zimbabwean police to then effect an arrest on Munuye, as compared to if the person was in Zimbabwe and the person who was buying was also in Zimbabwe, it would have been easier for the police to um, handle that crime. But now Kanaya involve um, uh, different countries. Shing Jabra opens an Interpol, which is a whole different process also in India in that particular investigation. So basically uh, those are the different um, incentives Aka Tauranet is researcher on the claw, which justify why um, criminals may want to move their activities from the physical to Shienda onto the internet. So as I mentioned earlier, by also, this is what we'd also call a typical examination question. So you can go and, uh, I think it's also covered in my video as you are and, and the share for this chapter. So you can also go further and read a bit more on this particular topic. Um, but I think for today, that is all I had for you. I don't know if there are any questions. I have a question in me. Yes, Nyarazu, you can go ahead. Um, it, um, I would like to describe a scenario and to know if it's a cyber crime or not. A situation whereby um, someone mm -hmm. is influenced to, to do a certain action via intern, like via an app or maybe YouTube, or like there, um, I watched this documentary whereby these children committed uh, murder uh, because of an app, a game they were playing, and it told them to kill their friend or something like that. Is it, who, who, who is the culprit here? The one who influenced or the one who did the action or, and is it a cybercrime? Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting um, scenario. Um, but it factors in a, a topic, I don't think we discussed it in this course, you know, the grooming, where basically people manipulate children or younger people, could relate some malicious activities and so forth. Um, I'm not sure if it's there in our, in our soon to be cyber law, but in many other countries, grooming is actually a crime. So even if, um, of course, Munacho, our committee the crime Munacho, will be arrested, but then at times, or in some countries, they say, but see, the person who has done the grooming is also culpable for the same thing. I, I don't think it's there in Zimbabwe, I, because I, I don't think we defined grooming as a crime. But in many countries, grooming is treated as a crime. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, any other questions? Hi, engineer. How are you? Hi, Tinashe. You can go ahead. Uh, mine is not a question. It's a um, suggestion to your most esteemed officer. Yes. Um, I am thinking that... Um, People who have familiar knowledge uh, around this subject are the ones who are participating. Um, can we perhaps in our next lecture try a more methodological way of conducting the lecture? Um, and if there are any pre-requirements that someone needs to know for them to have an appreciation of this, can it also be shared so that when people come, um, you see, I, I, I myself am familiar with a, a, a few other things, but now when we start talking about uh, technical terms and we have people from business, um, we will participate, but they will be lost. So may I suggest maybe 
an approach where we follow through, uh, even if it's a presentation, uh, coming through a de definition of, of terms, uh, what it means uh, from an assumption of we are starting from scratch. But if there are any prerequisites that someone needs to know that they need to prepare, maybe if you could also share that, guys, before we come to this lecture, please make sure that you vest yourself with such and such a topic or such and such definitions. Just as a suggestion, I do not know how many support me, but I realize that um, it might then turn out to be a discussion of experts, uh, an exchange of ideas with those that know, those that do not know will be left a bit behind. I hope my suggestion is well accepted with you, sir. Uh, that's fine. Um, thanks for raising that. Would anyone else want to also expand upon what um, Tinashe highlighted? Um, engineer, I think uh, it is just the same from what I had indicated yesterday that most of us are not even aware of what we are doing, why we are doing these things, and where we are going. And also, the other thing that I also wanted to add is when we now start talking of these technical things, of course, we might have had some of them. You know, in terms of uh, if you are a reader or a researcher or you are a, a, a tech-savvy person, but doesn't necessarily mean that you are equipped with the knowledge or the prerequisites of being an IT person or a computer uh engineer or, or person. So I was just thinking to myself uh, whilst the lecture was going on, is it possible that we might have sessions where we will be actually doing these terms on a one by one by one, you know, manner where we would say, okay, when we say DD, I I, I, don't, I can't even remember DD or uh, is that one? We are meaning this is how it it is. This is what it is. And this is why we say you have to prevent, or this is how you hack into it, or whatever that we will be talking about. Well, right now we have these terms. We don't know. I think that is my 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 input. Okay. Um. Thanks, Tore. Um. Any other contributions on this one? Or thoughts and suggestions? Oh, oh. Okay, yes, engineer. Yes. I, I would also say, like what Chaurai was saying, maybe if we can. Uh, Oh, but I don't know if it's on my side, but I think your connection is um, breaking a lot. Am I the only one? Sorry. No, he's yeah, breaking. Yeah, also from my side. I'm not here. Hmm. My side as well. Can't hear. Yeah, but, but I guess we, we can just assume that um, he was um, supporting what Taurai and Tanashi had highlighted. Okay, um, so... In terms of, the, uh, I understand that there's a need to get a better understanding of my terms, and all that. Um, I may have highlighted, yes, okay, that's fine. All right, so I may have highlighted um, yesterday, could see there are videos and slides that I've created, which are there on the Google Classroom. Um, for many of them, they do contain the definitions that, that you may want or that you may need to use as could see what is a DDoS attack, what is a DOS attack, and all the uh, other weird, strange terms we're using in this course. But then um, on top of that, I think I mentioned this also in the very first class, Kuti, 
the approach that we were advised to take for this particular semester is a bit different from what we typically do or what we've been typically doing um, in the past, which is we come to you, Tina, a slide, Tokuzeguti, um, when you're hacking Windows, this is this, and this is what happens, and so forth. Uh, the approach that they, that we're advised to follow was, Kuti, since this is a master's class, you cannot, um, well, for lack of a better word, spoon feed. Yeah. Kuti, most of the work that's supposed to be done by the class is um, mostly of a research form. So um, what would have been expected is we just basically introduce a topic, um, discuss further Pairi, and then when it comes to the definitions and uh, other, I, I guess, foundational things for that particular topic, people would have been expected to, to do a bit of research. But um, on my part, um, I think I agree I'm with Tinashe that uh, since we didn't actually outline before, the day before the lecture, Kuti, today we'll be talking about this, and today we'll be talking about that, so please read a bit on it. That was a bit of a challenge from my side, so um, I apologize for that. But then, so I think I mentioned also, but I think as we go into the weekend, please uh, um, go through the videos and the reading material. That is, um, it basically covers like close to everything that I was supposed to be teaching, or that was that was supposed to be um, spoon feeding, I guess, if I may say. So um, all that material is there. Arima videos. Arima slides, Arima links to articles that are there on the internet, and some even Arima audio recordings, a good kind of drive or something, you can just put it on and listen to it. So you can use that material. Then when we meet on Monday, which I think is our final day of my lectures and classes, then if you have any questions where you feel Kuti, you may need clarity upon or where you may need me to explain a bit more on, we can then dedicate that whole lecture to those questions. Because um, by then, when we get my two days or so, okay, we can go through that material. And bear in mind that this is not like the material for the whole course. The bulk of it, you're going to be doing it as research for my groups. So those three chapters or those um, three units that I managed to prepare the material for you, you just simply go through them um, further do your own research and can I panic and again you my slides can I'm audios or you may your information may be a bit outdated um, from what you said as to compare as compared to what is there now that's also um, very possible and feasible I will not be offended in any way because from what I understand I don't know everything so kuto you this is all new is uh, uh, even though I do have um, a few years of experience in this particular industry. So um, as a way forward, what I would suggest is um, use the materials that you put online. Um, that's the videos, the links, and I'm going to share uh, the slides, even the audio recordings. And then as you go through them, just basically list the different questions you may have. But in the past, like a confusion. And when we meet on Monday, it's not just me who is saying, Kuti, um, when you ask, Kuti, but what do you mean when you say this, or what does this mean? There may be another classmate who can further explain or better explain the concept better than I can to you or to someone else. So yeah, the bottom line is, please go through the materials that are there on Google Classroom. Then when we meet on Monday, that is what would count as the prerequisite for the lecture. But at least before we do these discussions, so we'll be on the same um, level playing field. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for for, for that. Um, I I I hope this will not turn into an unnecessary discussion. Yes, I, we, we, we've had other lectures. What, what I would have probably uh, suggested myself, uh, depending on who supports me, was to say in as much as we are going to, to it's going to be research-based, 
we just needed foundational guidance, you know, the first one, two lectures, just to, even if you had to go through slides, or maybe 10 or five, or quickly go through slides, just to have us get some found foundational guidance. And after that, we can fly. Uh, there are a lot of smart people in the, in the, in the stream. But that, thank you so much for, 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 for responding and, and um, I'm sure we will find a way of, of addressing this. But thank you. Yeah, um, that's fine. Thanks, Najee. So just, just to, re to reiterate, the videos actually report, they're actually um, what you're requesting, could be an explanation that goes through my slides. So I guess you could just say it's like a replacement um, for what I would have done now. But yeah, please just go through the material then, um, I, I guess it will help. Um, Albert, is your audio okay now? Um, or you can just type in what, you, what you'd like to contribute, if that's okay. Hmm. All right, um, besides that, um, are there any other questions before we close off for today? Hello, sir. <laughs> Okay. Yes, Eve. I just wanted to ask, um, are we going to have tutorials later during this semester? Or we're just going to have uh, group discussions where people are going to present their assignments? Um, so within the group presentations, it will be more of a discussion. So after you present as a group, I may ask questions. Um, the other students may also ask questions and I'll also highlight that um, you may have gotten lost at this particular point. So I guess we can say that counts as a tutorial, yes? Okay, thank you. Thanks, um, Theodora. Yes, go ahead. I wanted to say thank you and to for the videos that you said we should go through. We, we also have lectures tomorrow in Sunday, but we will try, but we also have lectures for, for the whole weekend. Then my my second concern was on on the lecture. If you're going to take us through some of the slides on Monday, may you please shoot or maybe um, other, other students who are in here. Some of the questions we end up uh, talking so maybe if you just stick to that, in the question, you're going to run an extra Okay. Um, I don't know. Yeah, um, I think I understand. Um, but just also to reiterate, on Monday I will not be going through my slides as a presentation. Um, the different slides, do I not see that my videos already, which are there per Google Classroom for you to go through. Because if I was trying to go through all the slides on Monday, then we would be here till midnight, I think. Or the next day, which is Tuesday, I guess. Okay. I don't know. That's fine. Um, any other questions and comments? Okay, um, so I guess in the absence of um, any other questions and comments, um, we can end our class for today. And um, I hope you have a great weekend. So we'll meet again on Monday. Thank you. Enjoy yours too. All right. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, engineer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.